Thank you so much for this wonderful introduction. Uh, very pleased to be here. A bit of an overview of what I would like to do is first of all, after an introduction, why I think this topic is more important than ever. Uh, I will go into, yeah, if you talk about this uh, topic, what do you mean exactly? And uh, so we will go into a definition of culture and then our seven dimensional model of culture and how it affects business, not only showing the differences around the globe, but also trying to find ways of uh, reconciling those differences. In other words, to take advantage of those differences. First of all, the introduction. And the introduction is all about the world we're living in. If you take um, Amsterdam as an example, where I live, 56% of people living in Amsterdam don't have Dutch parents. Compare that to 15% 15, 15 years ago. That's a huge difference. There's even one city outside of Amsterdam in uh, the Netherlands that has more non-Dutch people living there, and that's The Hague, 60%. I was in Miami a couple of months ago, and it said, um, we speak English here. They were lying. I only heard Spanish. And this is the world we're living in. And I'm not only talking about crises where refugees go all the way, but it's almost structural that we uh, live in multicultural environments. Add to that more females in the working uh, spirit. We will see more young people that have something to say. In other words, in the world is getting a diversity of diversity. Now, what's the problem? The problem is that our models are still culturally biased. If you read an American book on leadership, and there are only 300 new books written every year by Americans, you smell America when you read the book. Would that work in Saudi Arabia? Would that work in Mexico or in France? And the point I'm trying to make is culturally biased books don't even work in their own country. We have uh, the French book on leadership, and it's all about are you well educated in one of what they call the grands écoles? And are you from Paris and are you male? Oh, grand patron. You read a Chinese book on leadership and you smell China. It's all about yin, yang, mao, pao, tao. In other words, our publications, our models are culturally biased and they don't work in multicultural environments. So if some book says a good leader goes bottom up and another uh, book says, no, it's top down, what do you do if you mix those people and uh, we need a new paradigm? On top of that, our models are bipolar. So let's take Myers-Briggs as an example. Are you thinking or are you feeling? And if you score high on thinking, you score low on feeling. That's an example of bipolar model models even cultural models are you individualistic or are you communitarian collective and if you score high on one you score low on the other now that was fine in a world that was less diverse in diversity you need other models and that's why we are having crisis after crisis we can't cope with diversity because two things our models are culturally biased and they are bipolar what is the alternative now, the alternative is the following. Let's look at what our wonderful Ed Schein and um, uh, Einstein said. Einstein said, you can't solve a problem on the same level it was created. Now, we understood that in uh, wonderful Europe where we had a financial crisis and we asked the Germans to solve it. Now, that was not exactly what our wonderful friend meant. Why? Because you have to go one level higher, not one level lower. And how do you do that? Look at the following type of popular statement. We have innovation as a way to do this. Sustainability, globalization, and leadership. Let me connect those four in one sentence. Globalization leads to different viewpoints, of which it's the essential role of a leader to connect. And connecting different viewpoints is another word for innovation that leads to sustainable results. 
So in other words, it's all based on diversity and finding inclusion through reconciling those differences. And that is what we will do in our work in the coming presentation of 35 minutes. Now, let's take a definition of innovation. Innovation is combining values that are not easily joined, therefore scarce, therefore profitable. So let me give you two examples. What is innovative about Apple? Apple has combined aesthetics with functionality. Everything that is beautiful about an Apple phone or an iPad is also functional. Uh, the example of the glass plate on an iPad is beautiful because it doesn't have a frame, but also functional because you don't break your nails when swiping it. Formula One, what is the big dilemma, as we call it in Formula One? Is speed and safety. What is innovative about Formula One? That they use speed to make the car more safe. And aerodynamics is the way you reconcile that. So that is the essence of innovation. So innovation is bringing together diverse values that you never thought could be joined, and you make it happen. And that leads to dilemma reconciliation, is bringing together those opposites. If we go to a model, uh, if you like, a process, how we do this, it has four steps. The first one is recognition. How do you recognize the diverse values around you? And we show that in a model. The risk of those models, it leads to stereotypes that we need to respect. If you respect the opposites, uh, everything turns into a dilemma that we need to reconcile. And finally, as a good leader, what you will do is realize and root the solution, the reconciliation of the dilemmas. We call that the four R approaches. Now, this is my introduction. Let's go to what does this mean for leadership? What we have found is that successful leaders are helping their teams and their organization to distinguish, first of all, a problem from a dilemma. And if it's a dilemma, they're very good in reconciling it. And that leads to better performance. Now, you say, yeah, nice story, but can you prove this? Now, we developed a questionnaire. And the questionnaire is called the ICP, the Intercultural Competence Profiler. And it's a profiler that measures how good you are in the four R's. Look at the results amongst 8,000 people. Correlation between reconciliation, the art of combining opposites, and 360 feedback, 0.71. You can't get a higher correlation. Correlation between your competence to reconcile differences and bottom line business performance, 0.69. Amazingly high correlations, perhaps the highest correlation between a competence, in this case of reconciliation, and performance. Now, time to go into uh, an overview of what we're trying to do in this reconciliation. Our models are bipolar, meaning these are the Germans, they're square, and the opposite, uh, rectangles. The opposites are perhaps. People from the Middle East, very round, it's very, very hospitable. They're a circle. But what we need to do is, through respect of both sides, to get into the wonderful spiral that is connecting those opposites, and you end up in a cylinder. And the cylinder is reconciling the square and the ellipse by looking at the shadows. And so the par, the whole, reconciles the parts and include the parts and that is what we will do in practice from here on now what is culture take half a minute to think about and write them down on a piece of paper what do you think are the key words that come to your mind if you think about culture and then i will give you a little model and see if your words are covered by the little model Okay, I'm sure you came up with words like values, behavior, etc., etc. And obviously, they're all true. I love the work of Ed Shine. And Ed Shine 
although he used another metaphor, is culture is multi-layered. It is, if you like, like an onion. On the outside, the way the onion presents itself to you, it's the language we speak, the food we eat, it's the way we meet, it's the architecture, etc. These are the artifacts and products of a culture. And he calls that explicit culture. But be careful, you might eat sushi, or you might touch people frequently, or you might laugh a lot, which are observables that you immediately give meaning. But the meaning might not be exactly the same as those expressing it. So if people smile, you should ask the question, why do you smile? And you have to go one deeper layer into culture, and it is a shared system of values and norms. In a nutshell, the value is a shared orientation of what we desire, of what we like, and the norm is a shared orientation of what we think we should do. When the value becomes a norm, it slips out of consciousness and becomes a basic assumption, the very core. But before going into the very core, let us ask you, what are the values and norms of the culture you feel related to? And you will say, yeah, but we have different types of Americans. In America, they say, do you mean East Coast or West Coast? In France, they say, do you mean Paris or La Provence? In other words, cultures are different and they're represented like a normal distribution. Obviously, there are different types of Americans, but if you compare them to the French, you see there is a lot of overlap, but we tend to exaggerate the differences and we call them stereotypes. Now, I think it's too easy to say you should not stereotype. We do it all the time. Now, the French are always late. The Americans always sue you. It's not fair. Why? Because I know Americans that don't sue you, and I know French who are on time. But it's true that the French, in general, are a bit more relaxed with time than generically the Americans. So stereotypes are okay under two conditions. First of all, know you're doing it and secondly don't judge the french person once told me that the problem of being on time is the problem of people who are uh, on time and and that is uh, something that the french don't know because especially in the southern france or in the middle east you do other things so the essence of waiting is not such a big issue now final point when values have become a norm, in other words, when it works, if you have a lack of oxygen, you start breathing, and the lack of oxygen hopefully is an exception, but it, it comes to you every ten, five to 10 seconds. But if you're a healthy person, the norm of breathing makes you forget about the value of oxygen. It has become a basic assumption. That's implicit culture. And I would like to give you a seven dimensional model that goes into the basic assumptions of human beings. Now, first of all, the clash of cultures. Be careful, don't only look at the outside. I would like to go into the basic assumptions. And I would like to start with one example that I often use, and, and that is in the area of human relationships. Because culture is the way we organize themselves to overcome problems around us that come to us as dalamas in the way we deal with other human beings, human relationships, time, and nature. This adds up to a seven-dimensional model, five in the area of human relationships, and then time and nature. Seven dimensions. The first one I introduce by a question I have used since my PhD in 79 up until 82, where we were looking at national differences. And the question is as follows. You're riding in a car driven by a close friend, and your friend is speaking Eating, going 50 kilometers an hour where you're allowed to go 30 and your friend hits a pedestrian. You come to court and the lawyer of your friend says, don't worry, you're the only witness. Now, two questions. First of all, what is the right of your friend to expect you to testify to the lower figure, to lie for your friend? My friend has a definite right to expect that. Some right, no right. Now, now, I don't know if you're sitting alone, but otherwise talk to yourself. <laughs> what do you think is the reason why you don't want to be in this situation? And regardless 
regardless of your culture, I'm guessing that you don't, don't like to be in this situation because this is a dilemma. There is nobody in anywhere in the world that doesn't want to help friends. But neither are there people who would like to lie. So it's a dilemma that is human. And it's almost our culture that takes away half of humanity. Maybe in some cultures you, say, you should not lie, and in other cultures you say, yeah, it's a friend, I need to lie. Now companies have tried to find a solution to that. And that is, we need values as a company. So I was with a company that had integrity as their main value. And they uh, had integrity because obviously it's a good thing to have. So I was in their headquarters in uh, New Jersey, the US. And this was a financial uh, group. And uh, I said, how does integrity help you to solve the pedestrian's dilemma? And there was an American who stood up and said, sorry, Mr. Tropenau, I could follow you so far, but now I lost you. How can integrity be different than my friend not expecting me to lie and me not lie? There was a Korean in the room, South Korean, by the way, who said, sorry, John, I disagree. And they were from the same company with the same values. How can you have integrity if you don't help your friend? By lying. Now, my question to you, because I chose this company, that is a second value. We respect the culture of others. Again, take half a minute to think about what would you do if these are your values in the case of the car accident? Would you help your friend? And what is the right of your friend to expect you to be helped by lying? Now, take half a minute to reflect on this. It's easy amongst Americans. You don't lie. It's easy amongst Koreans you uh, will help your friend by lying. Now, what would you do if you're a multicultural team? That needs some thought, and perhaps 30 seconds is not enough, but take 30 seconds to do so. Okay, have some thoughts. It's not easy, isn't it? And uh, to be honest, I do this often, and I ask this question often, and I haven't had a lot of people say, oh, that's easy. Um, now, in a monocultural environment, where people agree that integrity is all about the truth, it's okay, and it's not a problem where they think integrity is about friendship and, uh, and supporting it. Um, but in a multicultural team, we need a new paradigm. You remember my introduction? And what is that paradigm? And I learned this in, uh, in Japan. In Japan, they said, you know, our option is not on your list. Because in Japan, we would test the strength of our work friendship by asking our friend to uh, tell the truth in court himself or herself. So we can talk to the judge to lower the sentence for his courage. And I thought that was such a great solution. First of all, it was beyond my question and the possibilities. And secondly, it goes to the core of what integrity really means. Integrity is creating wholeness through the integration of opposites. And that's why I started with this, because that's the end result of dilemmas reconciled. Creating wholeness through the integration of opposites. Now, let's practice this, first of all, by the four R's. So what is the dilemma and how is it created? Now, this is the first of seven dilemmas, dimensions, if you like, called universalism versus particularism. It is uh, where you look at, on the one hand, universalism, it's all about, have we given people consistency through the truth, transparency, while particularism is very much like, who was the friend? 
What is the particular situation? It depends. And you see the difference in scores. You see that the Protestant type of the world, Sweden through the Czech Republic, is really saying, uh, it's, it's uh, quite interesting that we have uh, taken out America, but the US scores 92%, so it's in the very top box. And it's quite interesting if we look at the top box, those are people saying in percentages, my friend has no right or some right and I will not help by lying. While at the bottom, Egypt, Venezuela, you see, yeah, it's my friend, I need to help. Now, quite interestingly enough, one is not better than the other. The risk, however, is that the people at the top, in particular in the US and in an Anglo-Saxon world, will say, ah, Egyptians and Venezuelans, they're corrupt. You can't trust them. They always will help their friends. But what I heard in Korea, Venezuela, Egypt is, oh, you know, the people at the top are corrupt. You can't really trust them because they won't even help their friends. In other words, you can always reverse the logics to show both are limited because it doesn't have integrity. It's not a whole that consists of opposites. Now, I don't want to get into details because later on in this presentation, I will ask you, to get some more applications of this by downloading a little app. And uh, it's called the Culture for Business app. The Culture for Business app is one, and I would almost say, go to the App Store or go to the uh, Google Play Store and uh, Google Culture for Business. And you will see it will show the app. It's for free. Otherwise, the Dutch people will not even do it. and you can later on, if you get a copy of the slides, um, see the link. But if you know the App Store or the Play Store, go for the app, which gives you what does this dimension mean for doing business in Sweden, Saudi, the Netherlands, Japan, 140 cultures. Now, what is for free is one country plus your own. And it looks both at your profile, and you're invited to, to fill in eight questions, and the profile of a country of interest. If you want more countries, it's one euro. And if you want the full 140 countries, it's 20 euros. It's a bit like the, the book uh, price. And the unique, let's say, selling point of this app is that not everybody gets the same tips. The tips are dependent on the difference between the profile of you or your country and the country of interest. Have a look. And I'm saying this because it will give you more insights into how this applies into business. Plus, it gives a nice summary. If you click on the I, the information of the dimension of what I'm just telling you. OK, now let us uh, look at some screenshots so you know how it looks and uh, the tips and if you click on the tip you get a deeper level of the tip etc uh, etc et so play with it it's for free so it's fun now if we take universalism particularism what is the meta dilemma in international business if you are universalistic you want global standards to create critical mass we standardize everything while in particularistic culture you say yeah but we are unique we believe in cultural diversity and we are different. And that is something that you will really feel as a dilemma you recognize. Now, what we do in the reconciliation is crack the line and exaggerate the extremes. So if you are a 100% universalist, you believe in globalization, centralize everything, standardize everything, you become the global corporation. And the rest of the world is called ROW. And they will have to adapt. If you are a decentralized multi-local corporation, you have different logics. And what ties you together depends in, uh, in the big four consultancy firms, it's their logo. Um, in uh, companies with uh, very much local attention needed, they're very often multi-local. Both don't really work. Now, the compromise is the international firm. It's a statue of liberty with a local flag. And be careful because these are slight adaptations. Reconciliation 
is the transcultural cooperation. The transcultural cooperation is the organization where we can recognize them by four characteristics. One, the top is diverse. Two, held together by standardized and globalized centralized values. Very often the sophisticated companies have yin and yang values. In other words, instead of saying we believe in collaboration, they say we strive for teams that consist of creative individuals. In other words, yin and yang values showing the opposite in the values. Third characteristic, they're very often polycentric. And the fourth characteristic, their leadership is servant leadership, which is a leadership model that works in every culture. We'll come back to servant leadership a bit later. So we have done one dimension. Obviously, we will increase the speed and uh, the succinctness of the next set, six dilemmas created by cultural differences. So mass customization is the big word for reconciling universalism and particularism. The next dimension is individual versus communitarian or collective. Look at the questions we have asked by now 140,000 people. Two logics to increase the quality of one's life. Give people as much freedom as possible, then it's the best for us all, versus you have to look after your fellows, then everything will be fine, even if it obstructs individual freedom and development. Look at the average of countries, which minimally is 200 people filling it in that shows for a so you see interestingly enough some surprises nigeria very individualistic usa netherlands finland sweden much more individualistic and if you go down the line you find egypt mexico india now be very careful and again it's interesting that we took away japan who is the top scorer in collectivism uh, at the very bottom but Mexico, it's more about the extended family. India is more about the religious group you're part of, etc. So you have to be very careful. These are generic ones, but in the app, you find the fine tuning of these countries applied to individual and communitarian. Now, what is the big dilemma if they mix? Because individualists, uh, obviously in America, the Netherlands, uh, Northwest Europe uh, are countries where you believe in individual accountability compared to Japan, most of Asia, where it's much more about group work. Now, um, if they mix, what do you do with the bonus system? Now, I worked nine years with Shell and we had a joint venture with the Japanese and the Japanese started to complain about the individual, individualistic nature of our bonus system. So we got a dilemma. And the dilemma was individual performance versus team spirit. Now that's interesting uh, because this is the dilemma in pictures. Do you reward individual performance or do you stimulate team cooperation? Crack the line and exaggerate the opposite. If you only go for the individual, it's me, myself, and withholding information. Individual bonuses very often lead to no incentive to share something with others. It's called silo mentality, me, myself, and I. The opposite is you hide yourself and it leads to team, medi team mediocrity. The compromise, again, be careful, is let's go for the small team so you irritate everybody. Reconciliation, and that's what we applied in Shell, is called co-opetition. How can we reward teams for what they do for individuals? And how can we reward individuals for what they do for the team? So in Shell, we measured team performance by individuals by just asking, who's the best team player? 50% of the variable pay went to individuals on the basis, who's the best team player? And we rewarded teams for what the team could show they did for individuals to excel. Now that's called reconciliation and it's symbolized by a spiral let's go at that co-opetition you individually compete to better cooperate you better cooperate as a group to have individuals excel the third dimension is simple 
and I don't want to spend too much of your time on it, but it's how do we express emotions? Neutral cultures have emotions, but they don't tend to express them. Think about Southwest Europe, uh, excuse me, uh, Southwest uh, England, and uh, affective cultures, the Middle East, uh, Arab culture, very expressive, Latin cultures, but they have a lot of judgments. Have a look. In my society, it's considered unprofessional to pr express emotions overtly, openly, at work. And you see that neutral cultures would agree that it's unprofessional to express emotions. So you see a lot of a Asian cultures, Eastern Africa, Ethiopia, have emotions, don't show them. Now, there are other moments you show emotions, like karaoke. Uh, on the bottom, we have the Latin cultures, many Arab cultures, Saudi Arabia, Egypt. You have emotions, show them. Is one better than the other? No. How can we combine them in a multicultural team? Have a look. So if we take Myers-Briggs, they measure you on four dimensions. If you take out thinking versus feeling, in other words, neutral versus affective, crack the line. If you are always controlling emotions, it leads to analysis paralysis. If you have an enormous amount of passion, but you don't control it, you're the loving neurotic. Reconciliation is the art of combining the two. How can we continuously check your heart? Um, and, and that is something that good leaders do. Now, some start with control and show emotions. Others start with emotions and show control. But it's always in the combination that makes leadership effective across cultures. My favorite dimension and, uh, uh, if you like, dilemma is following after this wonderful statement of it's cool to be emotional by Tom Peters. I love that statement because it captures the reconciliation of expressing emotions or not. My favorite dimensions, specific versus diffuse. A specific culture is a culture that is analytic and focuses, zooms in on the topic. A diffuse culture is a culture that takes the whole picture. A diffuse culture is basic. Now, how did we come to this dimension and, and who worked it out? Kurt Lewin, a German psychologist who went in the 30s to America, became world famous as a psychologist. And he wrote some articles about his culture shock in America. Now, he said, when I, as a German, went to America, I thought the Americans are like peaches. Well, we Germans are like coconuts. Now, what did he mean? Peaches have a lot of accessible flesh with a tough nut in the center, while coconuts are difficult to access, but once you're in, it's very soft. He called that, respectively, the U-type, the American type, and the G-type, the German type. Let's have a look at the U-type. Americans have a small privacy, the nut in the center, and a large public life, easily accessible. So some examples, if you're in America, before you know it, people are in your refrigerator. It's public. You need a car? Take my car. No problem. It's public. Have you tried this in Germany? No way. My car is private and nobody is driving in it. We have furniture. In America, when they leave, they leave their furniture. And uh, in France, they, they call it antique. You take your furniture because it goes back 300 years and you know exactly who used it in your family before you. Now, according to Lewin, this specific culture leads to two peaches relating to each other and say, hey, what is this relationship about? Even titles. When I got my PhD, I was invited to the faculty club of Wharton, which is quite a thing. And my professor said, this is Dr. Trompenars. Dr. Trompenars. Oh, I said, wow, this looks like Germany. No, you're a doctor in the university. I had a barbecue party and my professors introduced me. This is Fonts. 
So your phone's at the barbecue and your doctor at the university. This is quite different from the Germans, the coconut. In the Germans, in the German culture, your hair doctor everywhere. Your hair doctor at the university, you're still a hair doctor at work, at the barbecue, you buy a steak at the butcher, good name, hair doctor, you come home, good name, Frau doctor, everybody is doctor. And why? Because initially there is no relationship. But once you know each other for a long time, the do becomes popular rather than the z. This is z and this is do. In the case of a doctor and your wife being proud doctor, it's because you're one entity. Now, the big problem in international business is when the peach meets the coconut, namely what is private and what is public. So you see that in the, let's call it peach culture, Australia, obviously the USA, the Netherlands, straight communication. Everything is mentioned, everything is put on the table. While in the diffuse cultures, you wait and see. And that's respectively called high and low context cultures. I'll come back to that in a second. My, my advice for really avoiding the problem between diffuse and specific cultures is try to find a lot of private moments like dinners, taking people separate, where you tell people the truth. That's okay, but not in public. Why? Because this picture explains also loss of face. Loss of face is making public what is perceived as being private. Now, how did we measure that? We measured it by asking people, would you paint the house of your boss? Answer A, dear boss, go to hell. He's the boss in the company, not outside. That's reflecting a specific culture. A diffuse culture would say, yeah, you know, even if I don't like it, I need to paint because my boss is my boss and it's everywhere, so I need to paint. Have a look at people who said no. Netherlands, Bulgaria, UK, they say no way. He's the boss in the company, not outside. If we go to parts of Africa, Kuwait, China, it's my boss, I need to help. I was very disappointed by the Japanese score. 71% of the Japanese said, we will not paint the house of the boss. So we interviewed the Japanese and they said, yeah, in Japan, we would never wait till the boss asks. So you see the difficulty of this type of research, that why we're asking more questions than only one. Reconciliation of high and low context. Have a look. A low context culture on the right hand side, the, if you like, peach culture, they start in the center by making the point and then gradually circle out. In a diffuse culture, the coconut, you gradually make your point. But it needs first context within which you say something. So a big difference between American English and English English is Americans are straight to the point. And English, it depends on their tone of voice, where they say it. You know, this is an interesting idea. If you don't see who is in the room, when it's said, and if you don't know the tone of voice in which it was said, you don't know what an interesting idea means. It can be a very bad idea, it can be a very, very good idea, it can even be an interesting idea. Now, that's, that's why it's called high context. The context the, that, that really tells you uh, what the meaning of the word is, but it depends on the context in which you say it. A low context culture, the Dutch, are very clear, it's a bad idea or it's a good idea, and let's not beat around the bush. Very big issue across cultures. How do we uh, reconcile it? Now, first of all, never have balance. Balance is the middle of a bipolar scale. If one goes up, the other goes down. No, how can you have an integrated scorecard? Have a look. If you take the balance scorecard, it has four entry points, so two dynamics. We need to have financial performance that is specific versus we need to develop our people, which is diffuse the whole system. Now, if you only go for specific financial performance, it's cost cutting yourself. We have an example of a big French insurance company 
that lost its best people by going through cost reduction, cost reduction, cost reduction. So we did a workshop where they call this specific financial performance focus only cost cutting yourself. If you then would say, ignore it and let's go for developing our people, you become the subsidized seminar. The CEO of this company said, after what we call a dilemma workshop, I got the point. We will increase the training budget by 30%, but every supplier of our training need to show how their interventions help us to reduce even more costs. And that is called training for cost cutting, integrated growth. You combine both. I come to the last three dimensions. Achievement versus description is what gives people status across the globe. Is it based on what you do or rather who you are? What you do is your output. Who you are is your input. Your input is a scribe status, family background, age, gender. What have you studied rather? Or where have you studied rather than what have you studied? So we asked the following question to measure this. And achievement-oriented people, uh, basing their status on what you do, would disagree with that statement. Look at the huge differences. And again, applications, find them in the app. It's a lot of fun to use them. Okay. Now, the dilemma. Do we go for performance? It's lost democratic leadership. It's bottom up and you take people like in the Netherlands, so much serious that at the end you don't take any decisions anymore. You only be discuss it with the works council, with the other colleagues and you postpone the decision, bottom up. It's not working. Top down, follow the leader. It's the autocrat. It's the guy at the top that never listens, and you all drop down the cliff. What is a reconciliation? That's called servant leadership. Servant leadership is a model that works in any religion. All the icons, Jesus Christ, Mohammed, are all uh, Buddha. They're all servant leaders. They do something for society, and obviously in a metaphorical sense. We have politicians. Mandela, 27 years of jail, the first thing he says, rather than let's kill these bloody whites, he says, what can I do for South Africa? They gain authority by serving other people. And the best model is if you are a father or a mother, you know the feeling for your children. Is it at the cost of your authority? No way. You get more authority by helping them. And it's best pictured by is the servant leader at the top or at the bottom? The servant leader combines the two. Sometimes you play the horse, sometimes you say, shut up, let's go and eat. And it works in every culture. The last two dimensions are about time and nature. Time, we have asked the people, could you describe time in the set of three circles, representing past, present, and future? And you get different pictures. In America, a small past and a huge future. In Spain, it's much more about now. In Japan, concentric circles by 50%. And here we come to an interesting one. How do we relate to circles? Sequential people, monochronic people, do one thing at a time. And they cut time in very precise segments. 145 sharp. Three, you go into the Middle East, Latin Europe, Latin America, people are more multitasking, polychronic. And that's why they're a bit more relaxed with time. I think in most of uh, the Middle East, you have to pick the right day. Why is that not a problem? Because you do some other stuff. If you do things in parallel, it doesn't really matter when people come in. What we have learned from the Japanese that the reconciliation is called just in time. You have a sequence in the middle and you just in time synchronize it. Just in time synchronizing sequences. And finally, what do we do with nature? Are we dominating nature like the boxer is dominating its opponent? Or are we like judo being subjugated to nature? You wait till 
the movements of your opponent and take advantage of that force. Now, we had questions to measure it. What happens to me is my own doing versus sometimes I feel I do not have enough control over the direction my life is taken. Look at the differences. So you see cultures that dominate at the top, Israel, Norway, USA, don't mess with us, we dominate the environment. And you go at the bottom and you see Saudi, Oman, Egypt, Egypt, we get Russia, China. Let's wait and see. What is better is how do you combine them? Again, the other side of the balance scorecard, do we control our processes inside the business, internal control? Or do we adapt ourselves to the client, external control? If you overdo one, you're lean but mean. If you overdo the other, you're just captive to the customer. Pushing through the pool is the way to go. And let me give you the last example of this. We had a wonderful, successful company in the Netherlands called Philips. They made products coming out of their ears with patents, high tech, the CD-ROM, the this, that, and the other. But they very often lost the market because they were too early or too late. So they came in with marketing. Now, people will say, but Fonz, it took you half an hour to explain it's not either or, it's and, and. No, not good enough. Philips had and good technology and good marketing. Not good enough if they don't talk to each other. It's through, through, pushing through the pool. So let me give a summary of summaries. The world is getting more diverse. We uh, have models that don't deal effectively with diversity. We have offered you an alternative by, first of all, recognizing through seven dimensions the differences, translating them into dilemmas, which we then need to reconcile. I uh, would say this is innovation, is inclusion what you share, the nail, taking advantage of diversity, and the quality of the rope is leadership. Now, what is dilemma reconciliation? It comes from the Greek idea of two propositions in conflict. And we will see if we have centralization versus decentralization, then we're stuck in between the two. That's called bipolar thinking. So crack the line and try to reconcile the two into a higher definition of reality that takes advantage of the differences. This is my presentation, and I would love questions from your side. Uh, thank you very much, uh, folks. Uh, we are now open for question and answer. So if you have any questions, you could either insert it in the question box or you could equally raise your hand if you would like to speak directly with the, uh, with the doctor. So let me go straight to the question box. There are a couple of them already posted. First one, would you think that dig digitalization will take over analog? Oh, then what a wonderful question. Um, yes and no. <laughs> it will requalify analog. Uh, we, we wrote an article on the dilemmas of digitalization, and the subtitle says it all. The more we go digital, the more we go analog. Let me explain. I was with the World Conference of Retail, where all the retailers, the Selvridges, Jimbles, you know, uh, Galerie Lafayette, the big department stores were talking about their web shops and how they integrated the digital, the web shops. And Google and Amazon were giving presentations on how they opened shops. The digital people realized we need face-to-face. -face, and the analog people, face-to-face, -face, realized we need more digital. In our field, we developed a lot of digital tools, as I was showing one, because it might be helpful for you is that um, it is all about blending the two and asking the question, how can digital help you to become more effective face-to-face? -face? And how can face-to-face -face help us to use digital products more effectively? That would be my answer. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there's another one from Scott Putnam. The question is, can you share a specific example where two mostly oppositive cultures achieved success on a project? Very, again, very good, uh, very good question. Um, because it's positive, I, I take freedom to quote the organization. But we did a, a merger and acquisition um, help in the, in the cultural in integration of uh, Linda AG, a gas company, if you like. Yeah, they they, they uh, are in, in uh, modifying gases, uh, oxygen for patients and hydro generic uh, type of stuff for cars and, and what have you. They bought BOC, British Occidental Company. Now, the, the differences were enormous. Uh, Linda, the German company, was at the time very centralized, very German and everything was guided from germany boc was very much empowering people to go multi-local everywhere they had uh, empowered people uh, the leadership style was top down more in germany and bottom up more in the, in the uk we uh, did some interventions where we phrased that as dilemmas and they applied servant leadership in their organization and they worked on uh, what can we do with the depth of knowledge locally of BOC and the centralized type of activities. And uh, uh, more precisely, that company, despite the crisis, have gained market share and, uh, and share price. Uh, and part of it is because the leader at the time, uh, Professor Dr. Reitzler, got this point of we need to create a culture that takes advantage of the strengths of both rather than just choosing although he also in some areas chose either for the approach of linda and sometimes for the approach of boc but then it's not a dilemma you just take the best but sometimes both are okay and if you combine them you become even better so that would be an example of where they did a great job in combining cultures Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have uh, another one from uh, Dana Rahber Daniels. The question is, the friction between tribal mindset seems to be intensifying in many of the countries that you're, you're discussing from a broad culture patterns perspective. Do you observe this also happening now? It's... Um, you for, for again a great question um yes i do um if we just take brexit as a result of one of those thoughts uh, the more we feel we're strangled by standardization in this case from brussels perhaps a bit too far in the details and i can give you a recent example uh, that that is hindering an interesting uh, uh, fishing debate at the moment in europe but my answer is yes, I can observe it. Uh, the more we standardize, the more people draw back. And if we, we take uh, uh, Spain um, and uh, we take Basque culture and, and we take uh, uh, a lot of cultures where they feel strangled by two big entities. Because on the one hand, people want to be unique. And on the other hand, it's wonderful to standardize some stuff like the euro. But the euro has backgrounds, uh, has backlashes as well. Uh, if if the, the Greek would still have the drachma, I think that crisis was less deep. On the other hand, if you have a bit of a long-term view, perhaps we could help the Greeks in getting their house in order. Now, what, what I'm uh, trying to say here, I see both and standardization and localization happen, happening at the same time. Um, I hope that my presentation might help in phrasing these things as dilemmas. I think if the referendum in the UK was presented as a dilemma and not as a yes or no statement on leaving Europe or not, um, which is stupid in a complex situation to say yes or no, because if it's a dilemma, and obviously 
Europe is a dilemma. I, I'm giving this, by the way, as an example. We need to standardize some things beyond the countries, like immigration, like climate, like defense. These are things beyond national boundaries today. It's great to have that in a central uh, organization. And, and by the way, trade associations, as the UK is now feeling. On the other hand, there are things where you need to leave countries alone. And um, the number of trays in a ladder for people who clean the windows, who cares? Do it locally. You know, so I think we can do something about it, but it needs to think in dilemmas and take a European stance if it's not a dilemma. That would be my answer. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, seeing a number of questions, comments, so let me quickly move. Uh, we have uh, Professor Ayana Contardo. Uh, okay, it's not a question, but she's saying, would like to say hi to Fons. Thanks for the time as we met at Santa Dors Youth in Madrid on Hall of Fame. Yes. <laughs> yeah, oh, wonderful. Thank you Short so world. much for that. Small world, yeah. 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 That that's wonderful. We'll yeah. email separately. That's very kind. Thank you. All right. And then we have Mr. Arif Hussain. A quick, short question. How can we minimize prospects of conflict between cultures? Yeah, I hope I have implicitly made that clear. If we would just say, hey, I understand both sides. Because very often a conflict, if you're not part of it, has two sides. right? Even serious conflicts in the Middle East. Um, and, and I don't want to get in, 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 into making a political stance, but if they just say, hey, on the one hand, on the other hand, and then ask the question, how could one side help the other to achieve what they need? So instead of saying, do we need to be centralized or decentralized, you could ask the question, what do we need to centralize in order to allow for more decentralization. Let's take our human body. Uh, rather than seeing it as a conflict between central and decentral, like operating companies locally versus headquarters globally, you could say, what can I do locally to make the company more global? And what can we do globally to serve the local customer better? And, and that dilemma way of thinking can uh, help tremendously in solving conflicts across cultures of any kind. Thank you very much. And we have one last question from Tom McHugh. The question is, which of any cultures have you encountered which change perhaps radically? How would we prepare to notice such a change? Wonderful. Um, not an easy one. Um, I think if we go back to the definition of culture as a way to solve problems, I think dramatic problems that are either real or artificial, uh, fake news is uh, one way of creating artificial problems, might lead to drastic cultural change. And that is, um, in Shell, we use scenario planning. And scenario planning was two or three alternative futures that could be dramatic. Uh, but the real crisis, if you look at the museum of Motorola in Schomburg at the time, I don't know if it even still exists. The Museum of Lego in Bilund, they were all about dramatic crisis in the company. And obviously Motorola had a recent one because they're hardly existing. But if we take Lego, all the big crisis led to cultural changes because they had to. I believe strongly in two drastic reasons for dramatic change. One, a dramatic problem like a fire in Lego when they were making wooden toys. It changed the production process and the whole mindset dramatically. And they said, if we don't, we will not survive. And uh, another drastic one in Lego, it doesn't always have to be physical fires, when they lost dramatic market share uh, around the turn of the century, when they were just put it the playmaker of the century, and, and they lost market share because everything was standardized, including the end result of the toy. 
and later the internet they regained. So that, that is one, dramatic challenges that if you don't change, you will not survive. And the other one is excellent leadership. Leadership, uh, to quote Ed Schein, is the main core of people dragging the organization into systemic change because it needs to be done systemically at every piece of the organization. So leaders can dramatize change needs uh, pretty significantly. And, and, and those are the two major factors I see for change that, that happens. Any quick concluding remarks that you would like to give before we dismiss our doctor? Um, it was a pleasure. And uh, I hope uh, that um, the combination of my voice and the slideshow makes it uh, a difference. And I want to thank the mile organization uh, in organizing this because I really think I want to do more of this because it's such a delight to do so and the number of questions at the end give me an enormous hope that there were a lot of people staying uh, and not leaving and and uh, a real pleasure thank you very much well, thank you indeed, um, Doctor, for a very very interesting presentation and rather intriguing one turned out to be quite an interactive one. So I really want to thank you on behalf of the Medina Institute for Leadership and Entrepreneurship for taking the time to deliver this live webinar through our platform. So once again, thank you very much. And You're very welcome. And thank you, Medina. It was a pleasure. Indeed, the feelings are mutual. And thank you all of those who participated in this webinar. Please stay tuned to webinar.mile.org to learn about our upcoming programs and webinar and equally to access the recorded version. With that note, I would like to end and conclude. So you all have a good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are calling from. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much.